Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.2. In this episode we are going to begin by distributing our science points and if we take a look I, I don't really know which ones we were already unlocking. Let's see, I think we were already unlocking basic solids. Yeah, note already being researched. Uh, unlock in infinity. Oh great. Um, RL tens. Now, uh, somebody mentioned that uh, the cryogenic tanks do not get unlocked under early Hydrolox engines. They get unlocked maybe in general construction or advanced construction, I think it was. I like the idea of advanced construction in general. I think we're. That's probably. Because, I mean, as far as engine power is concerned, I'm not really particularly constrained right now. Um, except for that uh, NK9V. I wonder if th this NK15V has the same problem. It's, I think, the same model. Uh, but the 9V is scaled in a particular way, so maybe that causes a problem, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I think the combination of advanced construction, which allowed me to build better rockets, I guess, and uh, certainly bigger rockets, one would think, and maybe the improved stage combustion, which will give me probably my favorite Carolox engines, the NK-15s, would be a good combination. But hold on a sec. I mean, there's always the electrical situation. We've got electrics, but this requires electrics. Oh, I can't research technologies over 100 science right now. Okay. Advanced flight control could be interesting, but again, that's sort of a, well, Apollo docking system is nice. Actually, that doesn't much look like the Apollo docking system, does it? I mean, that was, it's supposed to, be, supposed to be a drogue, and then the, the other part. This seems to be androgynous. Oh, androgynous version of the Apollo docking system. Well, that's not the Apollo docking system, then, is it? Anyway, hmm... Yeah, but I really don't need controllers that control 20,000 tons just yet. Uh, we're still working on smaller rockets. Let me see how much it costs to upgrade the R&D building. Uh, 400,000. Well, I mean, we can certainly do that. Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, let's, let's just do this first. And tracking station. I don't need unknown objects just yet. That doesn't seem to do anything. If we want vessels over 800 tons, we'll need to make a million credits or funds in order to upgrade this. So that's got to be our next limiting factor, but we're not there yet. We've been launching stuff significantly smaller than that so far. And I don't actually have that many active contracts. And we already have... Oh, uh, we haven't done the EVAs. Oh, geez. Kerbals can perform EVAs. Definitely upgrade that. Okay. And, of course, those will take some time, right? Those are just queued up. Um, looks like the R&D building's got to take 383 days and the astronaut complex 109 days. Okay. Okay. Improve stage combustion. So that's what we've got in the tech queue for now. Hydrolox, basic solids. I'm going to move advanced construction and improved stage combustion ahead of basic solids. The basic solids is quicker though. But yeah, I'd rather get those first. Upgrade points, we got two more. I'm currently satisfied with the VAB build rate. I'll upgrade the science speed. Okay, so now we have 600,000 funds but no contracts. Taking a look, uh, the Jupiter transfer is obviously a little bit too quick, 98 days. Uh, for a Jupiter-sized rocket with that kind of delta V, I don't think we can build one in 98 days without rushing it. Um, Earth to Mars, though, we could do. Human orbital, one Kerbal to... well, human, no, Kerbal orbital, one Kerbal to low Earth orbit, and we've got uh, orbit below 474 kilometers and above 190 hmm well let, let's pick it up if we have to do the earth to mars launch first uh, we'll still probably have time to do this human orbital one well at least that gives a lot more funds and once we get into orbit 
I think that would be good. Now we've got a lot of Mars related stuff. Do a low resolution scan of Mars. Got the Deimos flyby, Phobos flyby. All of this basically requires us to get into orbit around Mars. Uncrewed Deimos landing, uncrewed Mars landing. What kind of mission do I want to put on on this one? Now, if we take a look at the Deimos contract versus the Phobos contract, I mean, difficulty-wise, it's about the same. But the Phobos contract pays more. But if we do the Phobos one, on this launch anyway, but while the Phobos contract pays more, if we do the Phobos launch on this one, we won't be able to do uh, the uncrewed Deimos landing, which uh, gives a lot more there. And also this uh, placing a satellite in a specific orbit around Deimos. So that's a little bit hard because it's really touchy. And, you know, Phobos, you know, you can get to orbit at a nice brisk run. So the adjustments there are really tiny. I have had trouble with Deimos before, but I think that is what we're going to go for. We'll, we'll get into orbit around Mars first, and then try and transfer to Deimos. I put a question mark beside that because... But I, I don't want to go too low around Mars. So maybe we'll skip this low resolution scan of Mars. Oh, okay, let's just pick up a lot of them. We've got room for three more. I'll try a Deimos flyby. I'll pass on the specific orbit one because that's just really annoying. I will try the landing once again, even though I've had trouble with that before. Okay, so that's a lot of contracts. I think I'll leave it at that and save the last contract space for just in case I want something else. Okay, so let me build some rockets and I'll be right back. Okay, I have developed a probe mission here as well as a crewed mission with an advanced crewed pod, but we'll take care of this Mars mission first. So this little uh, probe benefits, compared to the previous navigators, this now has extendable panels. Now uh, somebody had mentioned in the comments that maybe I shouldn't be using the Communitron HG55, but it's our only dish that can handle this sort of thing. Also it doesn't explicitly say non-RP0. And, you know, if they're not going to put the non-RP0 tag, they've put it on plenty of other things, but uh, as long as it's not on there, I'm going to assume it's okay. P plus, it's got the description, Mariner-style extendable high-gain antenna, effective range, suitable for missions to Venus, and etc. And we've already used it, too. So, yeah, I'm going to continue using it, because, well, we need it. And, so, yeah. That's the idea there, and so we've got some octos here, four octos, and of course one kilonewton thruster, but unlike the other navigators, this uses aerozine and N204 instead of just hydrazine, so it's much more efficient, and that's another plus in, in addition to the extendable panels. Um, I do want some more instruments though, we've only got the orbital telescope on there right now. Let's, I don't think that the... Um, Thermometer is going to give us anything new, but in case we do fly by Deimos or Phobos, which is a long shot, uh, I want it there. But the probe zone fuel, and you'll note the reaction wheel here, so we've got that as a bonus, but we've also got RCS just in case. And the probe zone fuel I will lock now, but you can see it's got 1,405. That's for doing whatever it needs to do around Mars, to getting to Deimos or whatever. Um, it's got a heat shield here, and this is a lunar rated heat shield, and uh, my goal is to have that uh, allow us to air break around Mars. So after that we have a Delta Avionics package, and the reason I picked the Delta Avionics package instead of the Able Avionics package is I needed the 10 tons, but also you note that it has uh, control for 10 tons, that's the little avionics panel, control for 10 tons, but the electric charge requirement is 120 watts. The Able Avionics package, the electric charge requirement is 150 watts. And at the same time, this is only uh, 1.14 uh, tons. The Delta Avionics package is 0.16 tons. So it's not that much heavier. 
it takes less electric charge and gives you more control over a larger thing. So that's pretty good. I decided that that would be a good idea to go with. Um, it's also not that much more expensive. And we put that ahead of the heat shield because if you add up the heat shield's mass with the probe, it actually goes over the capacity of the little octos. Now the next stage we have here is two Astros engines and now we have the thrusters also using Aerozenian N204 and you can see this Astros stage gives us 4383 meters per second that should be more than enough for all of the activities uh, getting to Mars, doing adjustments and all of that but we'll have to ditch it before going into the Martian atmosphere so that's the rub there. Uh, this has tons of delta V actually and we could have built a heavier probe but I want some margin for the first time testing this system but the next time we'll have a heavier probe okay so that's the idea there and the next stage is an RD0110 we've seen this stage before so I'm not gonna go through that and it's the exact same stage four minutes and ten seconds except I think it might be sized a little bit differently it's a little bit fatter uh, the next stage we have not seen before, and this is the proton second stage, the RD0210, uh, and it uses UDMH and N204. Uh, so it's a hypergolic fuel, uh, but it's fairly efficient considering that it's a hypergolic fuel. If we take a look at it, um, it has a vacuum ISP of 327. Move over there, 327. So that's better than a lot of Carolox engines, and it's got gimbling and everything. Um, Ray burn time, uh, this is, yeah, this is this version. Uh, that's well within the time frame we've got, so, yeah. Uh, you can see the stack of Thor avionics units. That's because that's the most efficient way to go about it. They're fairly light, and they give us a lot of control, and that's why they're all stacked like that. And of course, this is a super heavy rocket compared to what we've been doing so far. It's about double the size of our our uh, Tiger series. And the base engines are RD-253, so they're proton first stage engines. So we've got the a single proton second stage engine and four proton first stage engines on this rocket, which I've called the Radon. And, I mean, a lot of the reason for that is not only that they're efficient, but they're also very cheap. Uh, if you take a look, there's really no good reason to use anything else when this engine producing 1600 kilonewtons is 515, whereas this engine, which we've been using before on the Tiger series, produces half the thrust and costs more, and also worse ISP. I mean, it's sort of a no-brainer. And, of course, the reason for this is because these engines come from two different countries with two different economies in real life, but uh, it, it doesn't really jive when you're a single space program. I've made that point before that if it's a single space program, it's like a no-brainer choice. It only makes sense that they were both developed if you have two different space programs. Okay, I've locked most of the fuel up in the probe. It's got that reaction wheel, so it really shouldn't even use the fuel for maneuvering, just using the one kilonewton thruster. And I think we're ready to build this. Oh, I forgot to mention, these are just procedural structural elements. They're not fuel tanks. They're just to provide sort of a fairing for this, uh, for these engines, because these engines wouldn't fit on this uh, tank otherwise, right? They'll stick out. Okay, this is the Oliver on the Tiger 3, and of course this is a further development on the Tiger 2. Uh, it's marginally safer, though uh, the thrust weight ratio gets a bit high. It, it's not really 8.48. We will shut off two of the engines, so the max TWR is actually 4.24. Uh, the reason it's marginally safer is, if you recall, uh, we were actually pushing the engines on the Tiger 2 beyond their rated burn time and so they were shutting off prematurely and uh, the way to fix that is to not have them burn as long but the problem with that is that uh, you uh, you have a higher thrust weight ratio because you're not carrying as much empty tankage anyway uh, you, you might have wondered about this weird this is just a fairing that we will drop off once we are in orbit 
and the actual capsule looks like this this is the spacecraft and it's got a reaction wheel as well it's got little thrusters uh, aerozine as well and that fuel is locked currently uh, aerozine in here is locked and then this is the decoupler it has been painted and this is our aerozine tank for the asterisk engine and we have these um, emergency escape boosters and if we take a look at, uh, well, I can tell you that they have, well, let me just try and drag them in a place. Okay, so TWR of 6 for one second is what they're tuned to. Not much, but uh, on an actual escape, we'll also light the asterisk engine. So we're talking about 7 TWR, and then, of course, the asterisk will continue to burn. And the reason it's not much TWR is it's also carrying the asterisk engine along with it and all that fuel. Okay, well, we can put this aside for now. Okay, so as you can see, the on-orbit fuel, which is what is in the spacecraft, is 1,944 meters per second, so that's a lot. And in the case of... So, I mean, you might wonder, what the heck are we going to do with that? We can't get to the moon with that um, unless we have a different launcher. The There is an alternate configuration I was thinking of and that has supplies in this tank, it might be fuel, it might be something else, and uh, the docking port would go on the bottom. Now, the only docking port we have is this propellant-only docking port, but that would be a start. So we'll have a propellant-only docking port. It fits exactly like that. See, very nice and tight. And so we wouldn't have the Astros engine, and we would have to maneuver using the RCS thrusters, which is a little bit annoying, uh, especially for the longer burns. But uh, it might be lighter overall because we won't have so much fuel in the tank. Instead, we might be carrying more food. Right now, the food is about two days worth. Food, water, and oxygen, I mean. Consumables. Anyway, so that's that little pod. And then the rest of it is fairly straightforward, very similar to the rockets we've seen before. Uh, here we have the, well, I want to call it the RD-58, but it's really this S1-5400-11D33. Uh, and it's got separation boosters, RCS, and, uh, yep, yeah, that's a uh, small stage, 4 minutes and 10 seconds, giving us our orbit. The next stage is the RD-0110, as usual, and then the base stage is the LR-89s and again we turn two of them off halfway through flight. Okay so I'm going to be reloading this one. Oh uh, and this uh, spacecraft is called Oliver and uh, bonus points for those who can figure out that reference. Okay so I'm going to reload the craft and make sure it gets built. Okay, and we are building two Olivers because the first one is going to be a uncrewed test launch. The pod does have an Able Avionics package at the top of it, so we'll be able to do an uncrewed test first and then do the actual launch. Okay, but first uh, let's get the Navigator 5 done. Okay, throttle up, SAS on, and first time lighting these engines, here we go. launch. Radon rocket carrying the Navigator 5 on its way to space. Again, the probe zone fuel is currently locked. We are past the speed of sound. Uh, one engine seems to have loss of something or another. Hopefully the gimbal of the other engines can compensate, but these engines don't gimbal quite as much as other engines do. You can see a wiggle there. Um, yeah, I don't know what kind of error it is right now. Performance loss. I don't know if we can tell which one it is. 
Yeah, it's this one, uh, the specific impulse, so it's not efficient either. It's uh, losing us delta V. It's not just a loss of thrust, it's actually a loss of specific impulse. It's a time like this where I wish I had uh, action groups shutting off two of the engines would have been helpful. Uh, let's see if I can do it here. Okay, we are running on two engines only. That should be marginally more efficient, but might go past the rated burn time. We'll see how well they take that or not. The rate of burn time is 2 minutes and 28 seconds. Uh oh, we've lost another one. Uh, so I might have a little bit of trouble holding on to things. Well, I'm gonna call a shutdown set and ignition. Okay, RD0210. Hopefully can save the day here. We can help it out by ditching the fairing. Okay, very good. We current, currently have a fairly low acceleration, so I'm just going to keep the pitch up here. There's nothing to control roll on this stage, unfortunately. It's sort of a very simple stage. So let's see, we're going 2,200, let's say. We could probably get to 3,300 uh, on this stage. Next stage is another 3,428. Hmm, it's gonna be a bit tight. We could still send a probe to Mars, but uh, if it turns out that we need to use too much of the Astra stage, um, we might have to ditch the heat shield in order to complete the trans-Mars injection. So that's a scenario that's playing out right now. And we'll see whether we get to it. Now, in retrospect, you might think, well, I shouldn't have shut that extra engine off, the one that was working just fine, in order to shut down the one that had the performance loss. But then again, after the other one failed, uh, we would have had, uh, two engines there on the same side and probably we'd have a spin out or something like that so it might have been actually good insufficient avionics I thought I clipped in uh, I thought I clipped in something in here for the avionics darn it I, f I guess I forgot to put a Thor unit on this stage well uh, it really doesn't have to turn anywhere at this point, you can just stay pointed in this direction as is. But yeah, I'll have to remember to put a Thor unit on this one. I've done that on the Tiger 3. So I'm surprised I forgot on here, that's all. Okay, looks like we might have to use about a thousand meters per second from the Astra stage. That's obviously not good. Set. And stage. Okay, Astra stage on. If you think about a thousand meters per second from this stage, that leaves us with 3,300. That's not enough to make a transfer to Mars. If we unlock all of our fuel. We do have the 5,500 here, but then we're not going to be able to make orbit at Mars. It's just going to be flyby mission. 
at least we got some data on the new engines that we're using so there's that positive aspect though uh, it's not showing them right now okay preparing for shutdown and shut down oh we suddenly lost connection that was sudden right when I shut down the engines awkward time okay well let me well uh, okay I'll do the plotting first I do want to get the solar panels out though that's sort of important but let me do some plotting but we only have 3400 in this stage so my expectation is that we gonna have to ditch the heat shield in which case we can't air brake at Mars, and if we can't air brake at Mars, uh, we don't have enough delta V to get into a powered um, orbit around Mars. So it's just going to be a flyby. If we happen to be able to hit Phobos or Deimos somehow, that that's quite a trick. But uh, we'll see about that. All right, good news. We can get a fairly cheap transfer. 3,696.2 meters per second with uh, very low periapsis and no mid-course plane change. And um, though we might still want to do a mid-course plane change to sort of match the plane of Phobos and Deimos, you can see we have an inclination with respect to them. And But the question of getting into orbit around Mars, the minimum that would be required from this periapsis on this approach is 1,412. Now, it's conceivable that we have that much, so we're talking about uh, 5,100 altogether. Let me unlock, oops, let me unlock the top fuel and see how much exactly we have. Uh, no, we don't have enough. Uh, 4,800. So, as far as getting into orbit around Mars, we're talking about we're 300 short. At this stage, transferring to Mars, we're 300 short. Uh, of course, if we had enough in this stage, we wouldn't. Uh, we would have plenty of spare fuel because we would be able to use the heat shield. But right now, we can't. So that's the situation. Uh, the only hope we have is if we can get some sort of chance encounter with Phobos and Deimos, which is really hard because they're really tiny. Uh, but we can try for that. But right now, I'm just going to focus on oh, the thing as corrected to be a uh, suborbital path. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll do this maneuver, assuming we have connection. Which, considering where it is. Uh, I think uh, that's pretty close to that Pacific Pacific Ocean site, yeah. So we're uh, going to be communicating through that Pacific Ocean site when we do our burn, so that's fine. Actually, uh, I, I've just thought of a critical flaw in this whole pl uh, in the heat shield part of the plan. Well, we've got this heat shield, which is nice and all. But these solar panels, because they were cheaper and quicker to build, don't retract. So now I'm going to extend... Well, okay, I've extended a pair. It looks like I didn't action group both pairs. But we need both pairs for the transfer. But they would, of course, snap off if we tried to air break. So there's a flaw. There is a flaw I didn't take into consideration. Hmm, everything seems to be able to connect through this Lancer 2 except for me. Well, now we're connected. We're past the maneuver node. But since this mission is sort of already messed up anyway, I'm just gonna go. I wanna test that uh, crude capsule and all. See how that works out. We'll just, uh, we'll just fling this over. I'm sure we can hit Mars or something. Oh, somebody in the comments had asked about how long this uh, Realism Overall series would go. And I tend for this one to be basically it for my career series. Um, so as far as playing with RP0, I'm just going to keep this one going. 
Uh, I'm not gonna upgrade or start a new series. Uh, I've done quite a few RP0 series already and Realism Overhaul series. Uh, so I think at this point uh, I, I just want to get as far as possible instead of restarting all the time whenever there's a new version. Um, that does not mean that this is my last Realism Overhaul series, that just means that this is the, the ultimate uh, Realism Overhaul career series that I'm going to do. Probably not the ultimate Realism Overhaul series overall, since Nathan Kell's doing one as well, and he sort of made the thing, so... Uh, yeah, uh, tough to compete with that, really. But So that's the situation, and so you can look forward to me trying out a lot of things in this series without restarting from the beginning again. Even though the beginning's a lot of fun. Okay. Um, well, let's just... I don't know. Okay, I guess we'll step and continue with the burn, even though the burn's off. Uh, maybe I should replot. And that's the heat shield. No, that yeah, that's the heat shield. Okay, let's get rid of that as well. Alright. Okay, we are on escape, so let me replot and see how I can fix things. Alright, so I've got us on escape here. We need to do another 10 meter per second correction and then we have a mid-course adjustment as it turns out because we were off on our timing and that mid-course adjustment costs uh, 526. It's a plane change and that can get us basically on a crash course to Mars but that takes a chunk out of our remaining Delta V which is 983. And so whether we can do anything useful on this mission except for test the rocket out I don't know. So, bit of a disappointment here, but let's uh, get this on its way. Okay. And that's the mid-course adjustment, which we will put into our alarm clock. Alright, well, let's hope we have better success with the next rocket. Okay, here we go, uncrewed test of this rocket. Looking at it on the launch pad, it doesn't look particularly good with that... Uh, that coloring does it. it looks a bit weird maybe sort of like a marker sort of anyway uh, throttle up SAS on we're just trying to go up and bring it back down again safely that's the that's the net goal of this so yep here we go ignition time wasted. Once we get to 4 G's I will turn off two of the engines. Okay, 4 G's, two of them are out. Looking good. Again, uh, with this Tiger 3, there's no expectation that these engines are going to go over their rate of burn time. Okay, approaching peak G load. Set. And ignition. RD0110 is good. And we continue on. Now nice and flat. We can uh, knock off the fairing now, I think. Yep. Unfortunately, I can't extend the antennae. They're in here. Now, there is some spare capacity as far as Delta V. There are abort modes, various abort modes for this vehicle. Uh, of course, if it's still the first stage, we just use the escape uh, SRBs, uh, these guys tuck in th tucked in there, and then parachute down. Uh, on this stage, uh, we still do that on at the beginning. We don't really need the separation rockets necessarily, but we, we could probably use them. But uh, partway through this stage, what we do is we abort to orbit, and 
I don't know if we're uh, right there yet. Um, 2,900... Yeah, we're, we're past the point where we can abort to orbit. So if for some reason this engine uh, quit on us now, the remaining delta V here is enough to get us all the way to orbit, uh, or just shy of orbit so that we come straight back down. Now in the case if the engine failed at the beginning of this stage, we would actually use the Astris engine to slow down as well. So that way it's not uh, such a quick descent, so we're not going to hit the atmosphere with uh, as much uh, kinetic energy. Looks like going to zero pitch was a little bit too far. Okay, separation and ignition. Okay, actually this engine is weak, so we really do need to pitch up more. Uh, we shouldn't have gone to zero pitch at all. We probably should have held at 10 degrees or something like that. I'll have to make a note of that. This stage does have more than is necessary to reach orbit, and again, that's part of the redundancies to keep things safe. This does have multiple relights, so that's also beneficial. We'll cut this engine just shy of orbit and let the asterisk finish it off. Okay, that's good enough. Set. And ignition. Okay, that's good enough. 186 by 164. Let me make sure I activate the communitrons. Uh, they seem to be clipping the solar panels. Also, my action groups, once again, don't seem to be doing anything. I thought I had them action grouped, but... I think this is a little bit low, so maybe I should raise it a little bit. Oh, vapor and feed lines. Ha. That can happen. Okay, that's good. 313 kilometers seems reasonable. And so we'll be headed out to that point and then bring it down from Australia as usual. Freely using our RCS since we have so much of it, lots of Delta V here. Okay, I'm gonna go with 75 kilometers. And that's it for the service module. But before I discard that with all the nice antennae and all, I'm gonna uh, verify that the parachutes are configured properly. 0.3 atmospheres is fine. And make sure that the other is the same. Okay, yes, and then I'm going to arm the parachutes. So that if I lose connection, it should still be fine. I'm gonna say Smart ASS is programmed for retrograde. I am going to turn descent mode on right now. Uh, I'm going to unlock the RCS fuel. Very well. I'm going to also uh, turn hatch side down. Uh, yeah, hatch side down was how it was. I think that was the right orientation. Okay, everything seems to be in order. Uh, okay, I, I better not... Well, if I ditch it right now, I'll still head on in the same trajectory. Okay, so we will accept this... Yeah. Ooh, the periapsis got changed by quite a lot. We need to reduce the kick on that decoupler. Okay. Hmm. Hold on. RCS off. We'll use the reaction wheel that I packed on here. Yeah, I should have uh, ejected the service module facing normal.
There we go. Doing this little trick again. And we're back to 75. RCS off, retrograde, and in fact, surface negative relative velocity. Okay, we have atmosphere. Apparently we are over the Pacific still. Alright, we are now passing Baja California and there's the Gulf of California. As is pretty typical, I guess we're aiming for the Gulf of Mexico here. There is charred ablator. Ablator is ablating. Smart ASS may be trying to compensate using RCS, but the descent mode should overpower the RCS. But just in case it's not, I'll turn the RCS off. We're now over the Gulf of Mexico. 5Gs. I guess I can turn Smart ASS off and see what happens. No, it's not doing a descent mode thing. Past 7 G's now. We'll reach 8 G's. So that's not good. Okay, well, that might be what our Kerbal has to deal with. Getting ready for parachute deployment. And there we are. Are they the same parachute? Yes, they are. Okay. Everything looking good so far. And we have full parachute deployment bringing us to about 4 meters per second. Splash down and recover. Alright, so successful test. So the next Oliver that we send up, we will send a Kerbal and that Kerbal will EVA and get some science like that and hopefully recover, be recovered safely. As for the Navigator 5, that didn't work qu out quite as well as I would have liked, but the human orbital is the more pressing contract. Uh, Phobos flyby, uncrewed Mars landing, Deimos flyby, and uncrewed Deimos landing are things that we have some time for uh, to perfect. And especially we need some some extra data on the engines we're using for the Radon rocket. Okay, so on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.